side screens, we're uh, continuing our series of sermons on soul matters. And we began this series a number of weeks ago, and we began by looking what, at why the soul matters, and, and we concentrated on how God's grace has a, an amazing way to just impact and transform our souls, and that has a way of transforming all of our lives. And, and then over these last several weeks, we've been looking at some of the matters of the soul, some of the ways that we can actually release God's grace to be at work in our lives in, in profound ways. And we've looked at things like confession and scripture reading and prayer. And now this morning we turn to the subject of, of trying to clear out the clutter. But before we do that, let's bow together for just a moment of prayer, shall we? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our everlasting Redeemer. Amen. On Thursday, an interesting thing took place of which most of you are probably not even aware. A piece of space debris that has been identified as CZ-2F re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Now, from what I understand, this piece of space clutter known as CZ-2F was part of a Chinese satellite that had served its purpose, uh, became unusable, and then because of the, the Earth's gravitational force, it just has fallen back into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, the reason you probably are not even aware of this is because uh, most of it burned up upon its re-entry into the atmosphere, and it never really posed any kind of a threat to, to humanity. But the other reason you're probably not aware of this is because this happens with amazing regularity. In fact, it happens almost every day. It turns out that uh, CZ-2F is, was only one of 29,000 pieces of a space debris the size of a bowling ball or larger that are circling the Earth's, Earth's orbit right now. If you start looking at the space debris that is the size of a dime or larger, then that number moves up to 670,000 pieces of space debris. And if you look at things that are uh, the size of birdshot or larger, it is estimated that there are some 170 million pieces of space debris that are hurtling around the earth many times faster than a speeding bullet. To just give you a graphic of what all of this uh, might look like, here's a picture. David, would you throw it up on the screen for just a moment? That's the space debris that is surrounding our Earth. Now, on one hand, you may say, well, that's really no big deal. After all, we're talking about space. But imagine you have responsibility for launching a spacecraft that is carrying a satellite that is worth hundreds of millions of dollars into space. Chances are pretty good you're not going to want anything even the size of a wing nut that's traveling at the speed of 35,000 miles per hour to hit that spacecraft. So, for this reason, NASA constantly keeps up with all of the space clutter. And one of the things that is a growing concern for NASA is it seems that with every passing year, more and more space clutter is accumulating. Well, I couldn't help but think about all of this as I reflected on our lesson for this morning. The reason, my hunch is, that if NASA were to do a study of many of our lives, much like they keep up with what's happening in, in space around us, they might find that many of our lives are just about as cluttered. Uh, many of us just live very cluttered lives, don't we? We have all sorts of, of clutter flying around inside of us that we have to constantly keep track of, clutter that fills us with worry and anxiety and stress, clutter that has a way of damaging our souls and impacting our relationships with other people and even impairing our ability to think 
clearly. For example, there are all of the things that you have to do. There is the work that you have to do. It, it may take place at an office, it may take place at home, it may take place out in the community. You may get paid for it, or you may do it voluntarily. But all of us have obligations to meet and, and deadlines to, to meet, don't we? Uh, then there are all of the personal matters that you have to attend to. Uh, grocery shopping, getting the car fixed, doctor's appointments, making sure the kids uh, get to their various activities, finding time to exercise. Then there are all of the household chores that you have to do, mow the grass, uh, clean the house. There's always something to do around the house, isn't there? Do the dishes and, and on that list could go. And then many of you uh, have all sorts of church or uh, community commitments that you have made. Some of you are in service organizations. Some of you coach recreation athletic leagues. Some of you serve on various committees within this church or uh, with other charitable organizations throughout this community. And on the list could go, is there anybody in here that doesn't have a lot to do? If that's the case, if you'll meet me right over here in the side narthex, I can find a lot for you to do. But it's not only the things that we do that clutter our lives. It's all of the stuff that we also own. You don't need me to tell you that we live in a society that constantly conveys to us the message that the more you have, the better life will be for you. But that's not necessarily true, is it? We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But that's the message that we get from society on a constant basis. And so what do we do? We fill our lives with all sorts of stuff. But have any of you ever had the experience of convincing yourself that you need to buy something because it will help save time only to discover that it takes you more time to learn how to use the thing than it does the time that it saves you? Some of us some of us convince ourselves that we have to have all of this stuff because we need to keep up with other people and the world around us. But as Richard Foster points out, too often we buy things we don't want to impress people we don't even like. Well, there's all of the stuff we do. There's all of the stuff we own. Then there are all of the things that we carry around inside of us. Things like grief and guilt and worry and regret. And, and sometimes we even carry this stuff around when there's really no need to be carrying it around. I saw a t-shirt the other day that a lady was wearing that says, I'm worried that I'm not worried. Anybody ever had that experience in life? Well, what I hope you're beginning to see is that if NASA were to do a study of our lives much the way that NASA studies space, then NASA might very well find that our lives are full of all sorts of clutter. And what I really hope you're seeing is that all of this stuff has a way of complicating our lives to the point to where it pushes out the peace, pushes out the life that God designed our souls to experience. So how do we reverse this trend? How do we begin to clear out the clutter in our lives? I, th I think we begin to get a clue uh, from those words that Patty read for us a little bit earlier in our uh, scripture lesson. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that uh, when Jesus spoke these words, he had gone up onto the side of a mountain, he sat down, and he began to preach the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Historians have identified the place where they believe that this particular scene took place. It's located on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee, and it's on the side of a mountain. The, the, the surrounding field around it is filled with lush green grass. The mountains encircle the Sea of Galilee, and it provides a, a picturesque setting. And this particular mountainside where they believe that Jesus shared these words is sort of a sloping mountainside that goes right on down gently into the Sea of Galilee. It's one of the most amazing sights I've ever seen in, in Israel or any place else. So try to imagine the scene for just a moment. Jesus is sitting on the side of this beautiful, picturesque area. 
the disciples are all gathered around him, and he begins to, to teach them or preach to them. And at one point, he begins to look into their faces and into their eyes, and he sees the lines of worry, and he sees the lines of, uh, of weariness. He knows that many of them are trying to keep up with all of the daily demands, but they're falling behind with every passing day, and, and their lives are just filled with stress. And, and then he knows that many people are trying to etch out a very meaningful life, but hard as they try, their lives are just filled with frustration and, and they just live very frayed lives. And so Jesus begins to speak directly to their need. He begins to tell them, don't worry. And he knows that even as he says that, just telling them don't worry is not going to be enough to cause them to stop worrying. And so he reminds them of how much God loves them. And then to illustrate his point, he, he, he turns and uses a couple of very concrete examples. He, he points to the birds of the air and he reminds them that the birds of the air, they don't worry about anything. And yet God takes care of them. And to drive home his point, he says, aren't you of more value than they are? And then he points to the lilies of the field. And I'm not sure how this looks in your mind, but in my imagination, I can see Jesus as he, as he takes one of the lilies that's right there on the field, one of the wild lilies, and, and he just holds it up and he points out to them how simple their existence is. And then he reminds them that as simple as their existence is, they are dressed in a way far more glorious than King Solomon was in all of his glory. And then Jesus begins to try and pull it all together by saying, listen, if you want to have peace in your soul, if you don't want to just live a life of superficiality and chaos, if you want to live the kind of a full life that God in God's graciousness designed for you to live, and you need to begin by trusting God's grace. You need to begin by, uh, by getting rid of, of the clutter and concentrating on those things which matter most in life. And you need to begin by living as simple a life as you can get, live. So what's Jesus really saying here? Well, in my reflection this week, it appeared to me that there were two components to what Jesus was saying. There was an internal component to what he was saying. Uh, Jesus was telling us that, uh, that if we want to begin to clear out the clutter in our lives, then we need to make sure that that, that which is at the center of our hearts, our souls, are focused on that which matters most. And in verse 33, he told us what it was. He said, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all of this other stuff will take care of itself. Uh, what I think Jesus was trying to say is, is that when we have a singularity of purpose and when that singularity of purpose is focused on God, then it has a way of putting our priorities straight, giving us a solid foundation upon which to build our, our relationships. And it even has a way of helping us to balance out how we spend our time. Richard Foster suggested that until we get this part right, until we simplify our lives by pursuing first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness, then we're probably going to live lives of duplicity. Duplicity. And that duplicity will lead to a sense of chaos, and that chaos will lead to all sorts of worry and anxiety and stress. So the place to begin by clearing out the clutter is by making sure this internal part of us, our souls, are focused on that which matters most. But then there's also the external part. Once we get the internal part, kind of taken care of a little bit. And then Jesus 
seems to indicate that that frees us up to ruthlessly eliminate those things in our lives which are causing us to have complicated, cluttered lives. Uh, We're free to ruthlessly eliminate all of those things that we do for all of the wrong reasons. The simple fact of the matter is, uh, the, the more things that we do, uh, the more complicated our life becomes. And, uh, and so we need to ruthlessly eliminate those things. Let me ask you a question. Why do you do the things that you do? Is it because you're, you're doing it Uh, because you enjoy it? Are you doing it because you want to try and make a contribution to the corner of the world in which you live? Are you doing it because you want to serve Christ? Those are all very good reasons for doing things that, that we do, and that actually can add meaning and joy to your life. But let's be honest, sometimes we do things, don't we? In order to make a name for ourselves or to gain attention, or to get a little bit of prestige. And when we do things for those reasons, it just sort of adds clutter to our lives. So when we have that singularity of purpose, we're free to write all sorts of resignation letters and get rid of the things that we do that we don't even need to be doing. We're also free to ruthlessly eliminate all of the things that we own that we do not need. The simple fact of the matter is the more things we own, the more it complicates our life. And the more it complicates our life, the more clutter we have to deal with. For example, I know a family in this congregation that has two coffee pots. Two coffee pots. They have a regular coffee pot that they fill and it makes 10 to 12 cups of coffee for the morning. And then they have another coffee pot. It's one of those single coffee pot makers that makes all of those, you know, gourmet coffees. And, and, and so now, instead of, of simply going and buying the regular coffee for the regular coffee pot, they have to buy the regular coffee for the regular coffee pot. And now they have to buy all of these different tubs and they've got to make sure that they get all of the different varieties and that they get decaf and that they get regular and so forth. And now instead of filling one coffee pot with water, they have to fill two coffee pots with water. And now instead of uh, cleaning only one coffee pot, they have to clean two coffee pots. And you know how I know this family is in this church? I happen to love coffee very much. But the fact of the matter is, the more stuff we have, the more complicated our lives become. Now, in my case, I actually happen to need both of those coffee pots, but I'm talking about everybody else. (laughs) The reverse is also true. The more we relinquish, ruthlessly eliminate the things that we do not need, the more it lightens the load And we're able to enjoy life in a fuller way. Anybody in here ever clean out your garage and get rid of a lot of stuff? You remember the feeling the next time you walk into the garage? What a good feeling it is. Well, Jesus tells us that the more we focus on the kingdom of God, the less we have a need to fill our lives with stuff. Stuff to do, stuff to own. And and the more we focus on the kingdom of God, the less we have to hold on to any of that stuff. So here's what I'd like to invite you to do today. Sometime today, I want you to just think about what it means to have a life that is focused on the kingdom of God. And then sometime before this day is out, simply take out a sheet of paper and write down one area, one area of your life that you want to eliminate a piece of clutter. And then I want you to take that piece of paper and I want you to fold it up and I want you to put it in your pocket. I want it to be a piece of clutter in your pocket so that when you clean out the clutter in your pocket, you'll remember that there are things you need to clean out 
in your spirit. I close with this. Dallard Willis, Dallard, <laughs> Dallas Willard uh, points out that all of us are in the process of spiritual formation. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter how you live. For better or for worse, all of us are in the process of shaping our spirits. The question is not if you will shape your spirits. The question is simply what form will that shape take? And the more and more stuff that you have in your life, the more cluttered your life is going to be, and the less time and attention you're going to be able to give to being the person that God wants you to be. And the less stuff you have, the more you concentrate on God, then you're going to have more time, more attention to be the person God wants you to be. And listen to this. Live the life that God has designed for you to live. Let's pray, shall we? Loving, holy God, thank you for this day. Each one of us who are in here this morning probably have clutter in our lives. So you've searched us and you've known us. Help us to search ourselves and help us to know ourselves and to seek out those things that just fill up corners and crevices of our lives to the point that it restricts your your love and grace and the life you want us to live. Help us to ruthlessly eliminate them and to trust in you and your grace for the life that you want to give to us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn.